Hi, and welcome to the February uh, meeting of the Scarlet Quill Society from snowy Portland, Oregon, which is a little bit weird. Um, I feel like our land acknowledgement should come with a climate change apology. Um, there's 10 inches of snow on the ground outside, so the lighting in here is a little bit weird. Now you know why. Um, and speaking of, of land acknowledgements, we are on the unceded land of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, and Clackamas, uh, as well as the bands of Chinook, the Tualatin, the Kalapuya, the Malala, and even the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. And in acknowledgement of the rich and diverse, uh, that's a really weird use of the word diverse, I'm sorry, everybody, but um, the, the depth of the the use of this land traditionally yeah right donates to the naya family center um, as part of our ongoing commitment to acknowledge that we are colonizers of this land this is probably the worst land acknowledgement i ever do and i feel like i should issue a secondary apology um, but the naya family center provides culturally specific programs and services to guide people in the direction of personal success and balance through cultural empowerment and i hope that my terrible speech doesn't discourage anyone else from looking them up and maybe making a donation if you too are on this land or looking up where you are and who the people who probably still live on the land um, with you are that you might owe some thanks to and some appreciation. Um, but February, um, we are still working on tropes. Uh, we're going to be working on tropes all year, so that's not actually a surprise. Um, this month, we're talking about not just, you know, what is a trope? Do you need a trope? You know, you're going to, you're going to use tropes in your writing. You can't avoid it. But I have brought my wonderful co-editor at your right and co-author of um, one and many percentages of books um, and some, some short stories, a novella that we had published. Is that officially a novella in the Sirens anthology? No, novelette, I think, is worth what they would uh, probably define it as, around 10,000 words like that i feel like it's more i it all of those words <laughs> felt like they were more when they were coming out of us um yeah novella is like what 15 to 17 something like that yeah this is a question we get asked all the time though right mm -hmm. like how long is a novel how long is a novella um so yeah there's it no depends on who's folks. publishing it <laughs> yeah depends on depends on who's publishing it look it up on the submissions guidelines uh for the market that you want to be in and uh label your story whatever they call it so back to tropes um you can't write that many words together without using tropes it's just it's not possible um you're gonna run into them and you're gonna use them and it's gonna be fine right like this month we're talking about how tropes get us from one part of the story to the next part of the story and really we're going to talk about tropes doing helping the two of us do the thing that we do well together <clears throat> which is that christina's really really smart you guys and really creative and don't make that face you are and <laughs> um and i am not those things but i am really good at seeing patterns and so it's funny because when we write together it's like we're both giving each other prompts um, and effectively, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> still coughing, still not COVID. Um, when you write a story, there are some things that you're gonna bring to the story that are uniquely yours. I hope they're uniquely yours. Stop plagiarizing people. Um, and those things are going to be like maybe some characters, maybe a really feed the dog scene that you liked to write, that you wanted to write, a really interesting moment or an image that comes to you, something that you know you're showering this morning and you just have this vision of oh, what if these two characters, but in a glider, or what if these three or four people, but in a a coffee shop or in a 
something, something, something. Um, those are tropes, by the way. Um, the glider, not so much. And that's the thing that tropes do well, is they let you get from one moment to another moment. And they help you get through what Annie Bellet, who wrote like the 20 Sided Sorceress books, and I'm sure she's written something more recently. Um, and <laughs> we're actually IRL friends. And I feel really bad that I can't think of what the most recent thing that she wrote is. So I'm going to go look it up. Um, but she called it the Swampy Middle once. And I don't know if that was original to her, but um, it's it stuck with me, right? It's a, it's a phrase that sticks with you, which is you've, you've developed your characters now. You've built your world. And now you want to get to the scene where they they fight the big bad guy and there's the explosion that you've envisioned or the you know the the riding off into the sunset scene from the end of the princess bride or inigo montoya gets to confront the man who kills his father and you have this this moment um where you have envisioned the scene spoilers um where Inigo goes to Count Rogan and he says, offer me money. And Count Rogan says, yes, yes, money. Offer me power, all that I have and more. Offer me anything that I want. He says, whatever you want, whatever you want. And Inigo looks at him and he says, I want my father back, you son of a bitch. That scene is so perfect. And that scene could only come about that way. But how do you get there? right? How do you get from, I have assembled my heroes, or I know who all my heroes are going to be, to the confrontation in the castle? And that's where tropes come in. And I haven't let you talk at all, but this is the thing that you and I do really well, right? Is that you come up with these beautiful moments and these incredible characters, and then I just <laughs> steal them. Um, and, and I, I get you from one place to the other. Our first book, the first draft of, guys, don't do this. It's too long. Um, of our first book was 425,000 words. Um, <laughs> and it came, I know it can't be a trilogy <laughs> before anybody says it. It doesn't work that way. Whatever. I'm on AO3. All I know is that's more kudos. Um <laughs> But don't worry, this fic is finished. Um, that came out of, would you say like 3,000 words of these perfect, beautiful little scenes? Maybe, you were, yeah. You're writing yeah. different prompts from the old trifecta writing challenge, right? Trifecta, and then maybe even a little bit of, yeah, right stuff at some point and yeah it was it was a series One of maybe like, yeah maybe, yeah but they tended to be about 300 words each it was just sort of like these little yeah like 33 or 300 yes. yeah 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 and so you had all these perfect moments you had you know the character enters the airship and then you had this confrontation over this I don't want to give you many spoilers because we're still shopping the book. Um, there's a confrontation over an artifact and there's a scene where someone meets um, a character that is very, very out of their experience that they maybe have some prejudice towards. Um, and so you had all of these little like pearls, but they weren't strung together. Mm -hmm. They were they were roughly consecutive because you'd written them to, to prompt sort of roughly consecutively. But had you imagined, like, really, did you have a, a plot arc that they were all supposed no, to be No, and that on? was the whole problem because that's why I stopped writing them because I didn't have a plot. Um, I didn't think I had a story. And I was like, I don't know what to do with this stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is where Rowan stepped in and, and, and said, where's your story where's the rest of your story i said how very dare you stop i think <laughs> but that's how we started working together in the first place was yeah i didn't think i had a story and you could see that i had to string those pearls together yeah and and honestly the way i did it was with tropes and they're not even particularly inventive tropes they just work really sorry i keep leaning out of microphone range to give a treat to the dog she loves the snow 
I don't know if you saw the thing that I posted with her running around. It's up to her belly. And she's just, she's frolicking in it. Um, but she's very distressed that she can't just go in and out anytime she wants to because it's so far below freezing right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I apologize in advance for the level of protest we're going to have this month. Um, <laughs> I thought, I thought I had a plan. I did not have a plan. Um, which circles right back to the stories, right? Like, do you have a plan? Do you not have a plan? And there's sort of like, there's a couple ways to construct a story. And one of the classics, obviously, is to outline these scenes, which you did. You just had More written the scene as well. Um, and one of the other classics is to go full Peter Beagle, who is the author of The Last Unicorn. And Peter Beagle never outlined anything. He never outlined a single thing. Um, in fact, he did not. I don't know if I've told you this before. Uh, this is my Peter Beagle anecdote because I got to work on um, editing one of the the last unicorn coffee table books when the um, when the reissue came out, which is like my my big claim to fame right now. I'm like I'm very fancy. I got to work on some last <laughs> unicorn stuff, um, which is oh god, like ten years ago almost. Anyway, um, Peter Beagle was not an outliner. And it's one of the reasons that he had to stop writing earlier than a lot of other writers maybe stop because he had to be 100% on his game 100% of the time to write the way he wrote. Because he would just write straight ahead towards a brick wall and trust that by the time he got to the brick wall, he would have solved how the character was getting past it. He did not know where the rest of the unicorns were until he was literally writing the scene where the clock opens. He had no idea what had happened to the rest of the unicorns. None. Didn't know if King Haggard had done something with them, didn't know if the Red Bull had done something with them, didn't know if they even existed, if it was just like this futile quest. Sorry about bonking the mic. Um, it's futile quest the unicorns were on. Um, who knew? And then he figured it out sort of at the end. And the way that that narrowing process works isn't actually dissimilar from the string of pearls process that you described, but um, what you do is, or what I did was I took each of those scenes and I said, well, to get from here to here, and folks, if you want a, a big example of this, go read this month's post. Um, I did it to a Deep Space Nine episode which um, I will never not plug DS9. It's the best track. I will fight you. Um, there, are, there are so many ways to get from point A to point B, right? But very few of those are going to feel valid for the characters as written. And very few of them are going to feel valid for the world as written. So we knew that the character needed to get onto the airship. And then the next thing we knew for sure about this is that the, we wanted the character to kind of go incognito and be assumed into the crew of the airship. And there's, you know, there's no functional reason that a passenger on an airship would ever become part of the crew. As, uh, some detective somewhere once said, it makes no damn sense. Compels me though. Um, but that's exactly it, right? Like you start with a set of, of scenes that make no damn sense together, but they're all compelling. And then you just figure out how to get from scene one to scene three. So, while you're working on getting from scene one to scene three, um, you've got X number of tropes that will get you there. And again, I did this for a Deep Space Nine episode for this month's post where I said, okay, well, we're definitely gonna get to this end where these two characters have this conflict interaction and we need to get there from this point where character A finds something terrible out about character B. 
So we know at the end, character A is going to do the right thing because it's Star Trek. Um, we know that character B is not going to like character A doing the right thing. Character B is, in fact, going to feel that that's a betrayal. So how do we get here? What is what is the right thing? Is it help you build the bomb and then talk you out of using it? Is it talk you out of building the bomb in the first place? Is it, you know, what, what is it? How does that work? So um, there is, again, this month's post, huge parallel list of tropes that could have been used in the episode. Um, do you want to do you want to do a little bit of that live? Sure. Yeah. Let's, let's go for it. Did you? Did you? I know I texted you like really late and was like, oh, come up with a character for me because I have <laughs> zero creativity. All I do is spend my days editing citations. Um, so uh tell me tell me about this character or characters that you have all right so um this is sort of this is fantasy pseudo okay. fairy tale kind of kind of thing i've got a, a girl who's been locked in a tower speaking of tropes okay. right so she's been locked in a tower because it's it's sort of the fad right now to you know you lock your daughter in a tower somebody comes to rescue her you marry her off that's, that's sort of like the fad in the society okay, right this now it's very fashionable yeah exactly All the it's a fashionable be thing it. to do exactly and she doesn't want to have anything to do with it um and so you know her father promises um uh, whoever rescues my daughter from this tower gets to marry her you know half my kingdom all that whatever right so we're already um, moving like, into that as a trope mm -hmm. right and so you've like, taken this trope and you're lampshading it mm -hmm. you've said okay girl in a tower that's a trope what can i do with this trope that is interesting and that avoids the big trap in the trope i'm sorry i'm circling back to last month nope. the big trap where you have this girl getting damseled and she doesn't have mm -hmm. any agency within the story so right so the point is she's like well you know screw that i don't i don't want to be rescued i don't want people like falling to their deaths because they're you know, the tower is like on a cliffside or something like that there's this big chasm around it she's like I, you know i don't have anything to do with this and so she rescues herself she gets out okay. um and i have this so the the visual that i have is her <laughs> and see here's where here's where you know the the almost a literal string of pearls here i i don't really i have a picture of her crossing the chasm on a rope basically either hand over hand or sliding down or something like that or tightrope walking across this chasm on so this rope is the tower like surrounded by a chasm is that yeah is it like moats yeah okay. it's like yeah it's like yeah exactly um you know they stuck her in this out of the way place and you know okay, so the, tr the trick sorry i'm trying to because the other piece of this obviously that nobody else but you is going to bring to this is this world building sorry about the clanking mm -hmm. the dog is finally eating her dinner <laughs> um is this world building so we have like just basically like what a huge desert no a it's more like I'm think, no and then more there's like a, a chasm or is it like sort of like canyon it's more like rocky more like canyons more like mountainy okay sort of so it's so you know she's sort of on, maybe sort of on a mountain peak kind of thing um and there's you know you could climb all the way down and then all the way back up again um but somehow she gets a rope well, across. maybe i mean yeah yeah it's pretty steep so she's like, I'm just gonna go right across. The things it's, I don't know is faster like, to go over on a bridge, <laughs> okay. right? So I don't know, you know, why is there no bridge? <laughs> because wouldn't somebody put a bridge there? I don't know, like, how does she get a rope across? I don't know if is she doing this alone or is she doing this with somebody else? Um, it's more this this sort of visual I have and the feeling that she has of like she doesn't want to be anybody's damsel here. She doesn't want to be rescued. She wants to take charge of her own life. And she also is kind of oozed out by this idea that to get to her, people have to risk their own lives. Right. You know, for what is essentially a stranger who doesn't yeah. want to come anyway. Like, so that's kind of kind of an oozy thing. So that's kind of I, this is right. A, that doesn't feel thing. very consensual either. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Like, exactly. why why would a prince? Yeah. Or and, I mean, maybe not even a prince at this point. If like everybody's doing it. Yeah. Like, is yeah, she actually exactly. a princess or is she like a... I go, i've gone back and forth on that okay um i guess that doesn't matter for our purposes right we're yeah. going to 
it it would matter if we had to like narrow some tropes about that down mm -hmm. um one of the things that we can assume from what you've given me is that her people have resources so mm -hmm. there's a couple of ways that we can get her onto this rope and the things that we have to solve for are tropes that give us ropes yay it rhymes mm -hmm. <laughs> um tropes that are going to get her out of the tower um how tall is this tower is it like rapunzel tower situation and that's, then you have to get across the chasm because, oh I my know, god that's, that's a, good a lot <laughs> that is a lot it probably makes more sense for it to be not even like a tower but just sort of like a almost like a what do you call it uh, like a pedestal kind of in the middle of a canyon like a little kind of tower like, like a, a nubbin yeah yeah exactly it's, it's a nubbin although that's that's fun right it plays with the trope of the tower because you can start out yeah. saying um and this is one of the things that you can do with tropes right this is you start out saying there was a tower in the desert well actually it was only about 15 feet tall so it was <laughs> technically a tower but not really a tower and it was made out of i'm gonna assume that it was made out of stone quarried from this region um because that's pretty safe um some other tropes that you could play with for this tower are the, the tower made out of a unique material mm -hmm. so there's glass towers there's mirror towers there's ice towers there's um because like if you think about frozen right like elsa's mm -hmm. tower is technically a tower but it's not like if there's a staircase right yeah like it's, it's <laughs> if you can get to it yeah i think that's kind of the kind of tower i had in mind you, you know it's not necessarily inaccessible from the bottom of the tower to the top of the tower but the tower itself the is tower itself is accessible okay but it's a tower because that's the fashion yeah because otherwise yeah. there's no reason it couldn't just be the house from up <laughs> right yeah yeah <laughs> but it's very fashionable to have a daughter in a tower so yeah. her dad has now built her a tower that's like very very short yeah and there were other like other families have other rescue operations in process you know there are other things you know it's not all towers but so the other thing that this <laughs> is telling me is that her family actually may have limited resources so that's going to knock off a couple of tropes um she's yeah. using a rope so either she's not magical or she doesn't have access to magic and there may or may not even actually be magic in this world like nothing that you've said requires magic Mm -hmm. I have so, thoughts, but they don't apply to this situation. There yeah. is magic in this world. Let me put it that way. If if I write ever write this story the way I, I so if there yeah. is magic in this world, you're going to have to come up with a reason that she can't access it. Mm -hmm. Because that blows this whole thing wide open, yeah. right? I think she doesn't have magic. Or like magic that. has not to be minimally has useful. Well, but she's yeah. gonna get this rope, right? So material yeah, yeah. is coming in and out of the tower. It has to because she has to mm -hmm. eat. And there's nothing right. here to eat. Right. There's no, there's no garden. There's no. Well, maybe they had like a big bucket on a rope kind of thing. Basket on it. <laughs> well, in that case, the rope is already across the chasm. Yeah. But that right there is a trope, right? Is mm -hmm. the, it's the Rapunzel. You know, you have this situational. There's a bucket on that comes and goes, and how do I figure out how to get my character into this existing delivery method? Mm -hmm. So existing delivery method is a trope. Um, if your existing delivery method is it flies in on an eagle, hypothetically she'd fly out on the eagle if your existing delivery method. So there's one way to get her from point A to across the chasm. You don't want her across the chasm though. You want her hand over hand on the rope. Um, for extra excitement, you take the trope of delivery method, but, and she gets into the bucket and the bucket breaks. Mm. And now she's clinging yeah. halfway across. Um, so that's interesting. Um, interesting theory too, she has to make her own bucket um, or her own rope. And her rope then has to substitute for the delivery method across the chasm. Right. Um, if stuff is coming and going across the chasm, she has access to information the same way. So you have several tropes that you could play with mm -hmm. there in terms of a relationship between her and the person who brings the food. Are they her old nursemaid? 
Is it someone who knows her or knew her that could be expected to be loyal to her? That's one trope. Is it someone that she could form a relationship with, like Wesley the farm boy? That's our second trope. Um, because of the nature of this story, I'm tempted to discard this one, unless the farm boy is going to be the eventual love interest. Farm boy, farm girl, um, farm hand. Um, because if you bring this trope in early of the person of a different station, they are going to need to be a companion at the very least throughout the story, mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. you know, could be fine. That could be the direction yeah. you want to go with it. Um, but unless you want to deal with that batch of tropes and what they necessarily will entail, this one is safer someone who already knows her right. um that's interesting because it can lead to like depending on which way you go it would lead to a completely different story yeah and some tropes require other tropes and this is why mm -hmm. when we were working together on the novel having those four or five things was really useful because i can get you from point a to point b but three or four of those would have foreclosed getting to point c so I could throw away those three or four. And by the time we get to the end, by the time our heroes are going down behind the clock in King Haggard's castle towards the dungeon, the wine that drinks itself and the skull that speaks, there's only one place the unicorns can be. Mm -hmm. um, we have narrowed down our tropes to the point where all we have left is a story and we just have to put the words on the paper, which was very much how I felt um, you had done when we were working on the novel in the first place was that uh, all of the the possible tropes had been foreclosed and there of course the the book was happening this way because there was no other way it could happen um but that's me right like i can see the patterns that's, that's so interesting because i don't see those patterns the same way what i mean i you know when you give me a framework like that i can I can put, fit the pieces in, but yeah. seeing the framework, um, Puppy you know, this, is a, <laughs> this is a good why we work together. What's our creepy little hound of the Baskerville eyes? <laughs> um, so yeah, so there's there's you know there's only so many ways we can do it. So now we have your heroine, and this is the thing that I was talking about again in this month's post. This heroine is unique to our story. She might, you know, fill in some gaps or, or play with some, some character tropes or traits, but the way that she's written, the way that she's characterized should be pretty unique to the story. Hopefully you don't write a character that is just like entirely a trope. If you do write a character that's entirely a trope, science fiction fans, Simon Tam is Julian Bashir. Full stop. <laughs> full stop and like like literally they are the same character because there is nothing to this character that is not a trope um they are both doctors who have been genetically engineered for genius who are socially they're one character and, <laughs> and this is what happens when you don't try to bring in things that are uniquely yours or ideas that are uniquely yours. Um, not every character has to be uniquely yours. It's okay to write a character that relies on some stock footage, I guess we could call it, but watch out because depending on where your stock footage comes from, there's a lot of freight there. Like, the, the big trap of the trope that you're playing with is the self-rescuing princess mm -hmm. is used over and over and over mm -hmm. again as a white feminist empowerment story. Which I'd want to avoid, yeah. <laughs> right, so you're going to have to watch out for, and you know, I hate saying you have to watch out for rah-rah girl power. Because, <laughs> you know, we do need, we do need those stories, but 
you have to make sure that you are not lensing this white for white writing, right? So you will want to get maybe a sensitivity <laughs> reading. Yes, the cat exists. Thank you. Um, maybe a cultural competency reader, mm -hmm. just somebody who can be like, oh, this is, I can't even yeah. see myself in this story. I wouldn't give this story to my kid. And here's why. Yeah. Um, for sure. And that so that's for a big trap for that trap. It goes yeah. for a whole lot of things, right? Yeah. But it's who you need to get as your reader depends on which pointy side of your building block is up right? Mm -hmm. um, so we start out, we've got our princess. She's not a princess. Her oh. family has limited. Well, look, they're taking advantage yeah. of the land. They're taking advantage of the lay of the land. They didn't hire a wizard to make these chasms. They didn't mm -hmm. have a tall tower anyway. They probably are not magicking the food into the tower. If they are magicking the food into the tower. That's really interesting because are they using a replicator style magic? Like a, if, one of those tables that just fills with food? No, like literally a Star Trek replicator. Oh. <laughs> those are magic. I'm oh, sorry, those. everybody, Trek yeah. has magic in it and the replicator is magic. <laughs> um, totally. A hundred percent. Um. 100% that is magic. That's not sci-fi. Um, <laughs> which is great because now we have the idea that you have a box that you can open up and get the food that you want. Mm -hmm. If so, is that how we get our rope? Mm -hmm. So solving Replicated one problem. Right can, well, I would imagine that nobody is going to be stupid enough. So we're going to have to come up with a reason. So it can only be food. So she's going to have to come up with a food that has fiber mm -hmm. that could be used to spin a rope. Yeah. So now she's eating loofah and bitter melon. I mean, people, people <laughs> yeah. do. People eat loofah. Yeah. Um, people eat all kinds of, of melon. Um, there, are, there are almost certainly other things. She also has to get... Um, fresh goods she has to get like this is a problem that people don't solve for a lot but solving for it can solve for other problems like i was saying 10 seconds ago um how do you do laundry if you are a princess in a tower <laughs> right yeah do you have fresh where does the water come from yeah where does the yeah. water come from um do you put your things into the magic box and they come back all fresh Stephen King used this um, in Eyes of the Dragon, where he had a character build a rope. Um, the book is like 40 years old. This cannot possibly yeah. be spoilers. Um, <laughs> by unraveling a few threads at a time from things that were brought into his cell. And it was literally just a few threads at a time. So could your princess unravel? I keep calling her a princess. We're going to call her a princess because that's the trope position she fills. She's not a princess. Yeah. Or if she is a princess, her kingdom is very impoverished. Yeah. Um, you know, do her people have how much resources? Let's go back to a thing that only you can do your creative piece, because this will help us narrow down the tropes. How available is magic in your world? It's not a, it's not an everybody has it kind of thing. Okay. But it's, it's also not a uh, surprising thing. It's not like, whoa, how did you do that? And if so, there, there are people who can, who can do magic. There are people who are magical. I have okay. pe people in this world there's also a 12 dancing princesses thing going, not 12 dancing princesses, the swans, the 12 swans, is that what it is? Oh, the, the um, swan princes? Swan prin princes, yeah, there's yeah. something There's something about that going in there. So there's, you know, transformation magic that way. Okay. Um, I have in my head that there's a sorceress at the end of the, the story who's involved in whatever the story ends up being. I haven't really decided yet. Whatever the story ends so, up being, yeah. but they're gonna hook up. 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah called it. I mean, you yeah. know how this goes. <laughs> yeah. Rowan's read a few of my things before. <laughs> um, I didn't uh, think I wrote romances. Christine writes these wonderful, achingly horny <laughs> stories. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true that like all of your characters are just like um, about to expire, terminal horny? Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, <coughs> sorry my autoimmune system is just after my lungs it's great i love it it's good times um so okay so why can't we i need a reason that we can't just magic her out of this tower well let's see so there are several tropes for why we can't mm -hmm. because anytime you're gonna say like why don't they just mm -hmm. and you're like oh shit i did not even think of you know why didn't bilbo just get on the lord of the eagles <laughs> there is an in-world reason for that there there genuinely is um I will leave the exercise to the reader and the Google to come up with it, but um, but anytime you come up with a why didn't they just, there are going to be three or four tropes that can fill it. So I'm going to start throwing those out, mm -hmm. and you shout when I hit one that feels right. Yeah. Okay. Reason number one: there are also magical dead zones, and they parked this tower in what is effectively a magical dead zone that will eliminate us being able to use any of the food comes in by magic mm -hmm. so that would shut down a lot of other trips um number two counter spells exist and they've just had a wizard do some counter spells um three magic isn't actually that powerful Mm -hmm. <laughs> it can do a lot of things but it's not like oh i can just teleport you it's not dnd &D. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but dnd &D isn't even that i mm -hmm. i am drawn back to my early gaming days when you couldn't mix white wolf properties because <laughs> the mages and the changelings were so overpowered compared to the vampires and the werewolves and the wraiths <laughs> that like a one really really simple mage spell was open a very small portal to somewhere and within the mage universe that was very unpowerful right because like putting your finger through something not all that useful um if on the other hand you open a finger-sized portal to daylight you are now the ultimate vampire slayer and you just walk <laughs> around with your little daylight portal and it costs you like nothing to make and you just murder <laughs> everyone so that's uh that was intense anyway so mm. <coughs> so there are limits on magic so some of the tropes for magical limits are you can only do magic on a willing subject you can only do magic on a subject that knows about it. You can only do magic on a subject that consents. One of the things that I like about the trope of you can only do magic on a subject that consents is it opens the door for a lot of shortcuts later in your story mm -hmm. to talk about character attraction, character interaction, character trust, and character consent. Which is if, actually a lot of what I want this story to be about anyway. Okay, so that's our winner. Yeah. Is that magic can only be used on another with their knowledge and consent. So, <laughs> I should be taking notes here because you may have just actually surprise there's a recording. You're gonna be fine. <laughs> um, speaking of recording, so, like, subscribe, child, do yes. the things. Hello, the yeah. child. See my child in a bathroom. Um <laughs> See, this is going to be great because you're going to be able to fast forward through the recording until you see the kid in the bathrobe, and then you are going to, <laughs> and then you're going to know that that's exactly where we solved the problem. Right? Yeah. But oh my so, God. knowledge and consent now 
is a trope that is a limiting trope on all of the original tropes that we could have used to get her food and to get her onto mm-hmm. the rope. So now that we're bumping around between our pearls, we have now limited our trope universe considerably. And we have like largely these boring parts kind of written for us, right? Mm-hmm. So now we know that the food can't be coming to her with magic unless the person who brings the food is using the magic on themselves or something that they're touching, holding, actively interacting with. Right, right. So hypothetically, they could come over with a rope and a bucket and the rope like moves itself kind of yeah it could snake itself rope of climbing yeah oh i i do love a rope of climbing (laughs) i also love the ladder sticks where you can the immovable rods yeah Yeah. immovable rods yeah i you can tell i don't want this is not not a D &D story (laughs) (laughs) like i was like oh i could totally use no no speaking of tropes i don't yeah. But yeah, yeah, D and D depends heavily on tropes for its magic, and it's oh, yeah. one of the reasons that D and D has struggled so hard. While we're talking about trope pitfalls, struggled so hard with getting the racism out of its stuff, because mm-hmm. it was created by a bunch of white guys who just sort of poured unexamined tropes in. Um, the way that. Joe Rowling borrowed every bit of mythology for the first Harry Potter book without examining where it came from um, and and dumped it on in. And she wasn't best positioned to assess whether these things were racist or racist or very (laughs) racist. Um, And she didn't, I don't think she showed it to anyone who was positioned to assess that or took their feedback if she did. But um, but that's the, the problem with, with Dungeons and Dragons is now you get into how do we pull this out? And it's like this problem is just blown into every single portion of your property. You have this entire race is evil. Mm-hmm. You have, which is a hell of a trope, right? Um, you have people who live in the dark and are ugly are evil you have dark-skinned races are evil you have and Mm. and throwing in a dark-skinned good race um is only going to work so far because then you just map all of these other desirable traits onto it and you've made um oh i just read like three or four tropes on tv trips this morning um prepping for this session um about racialized characters and basically white and you know and or you decontextualize them or you're like all black elves are bad but these guys are good and you can tell that they're good because we've mapped weirdly Japanese traits onto them and I'm like that's a whole (laughs) different racism good job good job you guys good job Mm -hmm. um (coughs) so okay so now that we've we've narrowed this down to consent magic we have a princess we have a rope the princess cannot use magic on the rope so it cannot be true that either the rope has to be a magical artifact or the rope has to be made in the tower or the rope has to be transported to her. Mm-hmm. So these, we've now narrowed down from all of the million ways we could get her on the rope to mm-hmm. three. Yeah. And then you just get to pick your favorite of that three and write it. And you will get your princess on the rope and it will be really, really exciting. <laughs> and, and now you know how magic works. So you have a much better idea <laughs> of what the next thing that she can or can't do when she gets right, off the yeah. rope is. So this is so great, that's, actually. Then. That's what it looks <laughs> like in 2025. <laughs> in real time, yeah. when you take unique characters and unique world building and you say, I need to map from here to here to here to here to my horny sorceress at the end. 
<laughs> um, I, I would say like this is useful for like this exercise that we just sort of did. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to do it with somebody else than to sit there and try and do it yourself. I mean, some some people. I mean, obviously, everybody's different. Uh, but having somebody else ask those questions, like, well, why don't they just? Because yeah. everybody's got their own blind spots, right? So having somebody else ask those questions um, is a really great way to kind of. The you other along. thing is it frees you up, right? Like you mm -hmm. just get to sit there and think. And all I'm doing is I literally just have a list of tropes over <laughs> here. Like I have a TV tropes index up on my, <laughs> on my giant, nice. um, work monitor. And I I'm literally just looking over and being like, here's like three magical tropes. And so you can just have someone else throw those at you. And if you are the someone else for this exercise, if you're me, if you're person B, don't worry about being original. Don't worry about making original contributions to the story. Talk about ways you've seen it solved frequently other places. That's fine. That's that's what we just did, right? I'm like, oh, Stephen mm -hmm. King did this. And then, you know, Inigo Montoya did this. The rope to get up the cliffs of despair was just mm -hmm. left there because they were <laughs> climbing it. Um, I don't, did Goldman say in the book how the rope got um there? My impression was that they had set it up ahead of time, but yeah, but how? I don't remember for sure. I don't remember yeah, if they, they had come over someone... land and then down. I, I don't know. Did they did they climb down the cliffs of despair to begin with in the book, and then I sail? Know. I don't because my impression even... was they were coming back a different. It's in the book. It's in the book. It is in the book. I'm I have to go back and reread that. <laughs> I know. Do you, do you have a copy? I do. Yes. Oh, good. Because I can't find mine. And I'm <laughs> really curious now. Um, because I remember the book talking about how they get to um, Florin. And um, and I remember it's one of those, I think it's one of the spots that the grandfather sort of says, and then they did this and this and this and then this. Or when they're coming back up the rope, they're like, oh, this, a, a farmhand had tied the rope three days before that they had paid to blah, 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 or, or something like that. Like, I, I remember yeah. there was an explanation. Well, and I'm, the, absolutely gonna I'm look not that mad at now. the movie for not explaining mm -hmm. it because it didn't need to. It's, it's, it's a romp, but yeah. So, so yeah. So, you know, don't worry about being original. That's not your job. Your job is to show the writer enough bricks that some of them are going to be the right bricks and then once the writer picks a brick that they're excited about you can push most of this pile away and you can just eliminate that the dog's eyes are really creepy behind my shoulder like <laughs> little sparkles um i'm just gonna sit right here it's gonna be super spooky um oh now she's not gonna look um <laughs> i'm never gonna be able to stop laughing um <clears throat> you know eventually you are going to be left with exactly enough bricks to build the wall or the bridge or the whatever you need and to support those unique elements the the fad for the princess in the tower the fact that nobody actually cares that she's a, a princess in a tower effectively even her she's like yeah do you because it's not like Rapunzel, right? Like it's not like right. the witch is like, heck you all. I yeah, your father cried, your mother died, <laughs> and for extra measure, I'll admit it was a pleasure. I said, sorry, I'm still not mollified. Um <laughs> so you know she's got a reason for putting this kid in a tower. And then people explore, is it like entangled where Mother Gothel has this really creepy gaslighty thing that she's doing? Um nobody will love you but me is it like into the woods where it is less creepy and gaslighty but still very controlling um whether that comes from a good place whether it comes from a bad place whether it's more like some of the original fairy tales where she just wants to keep her away from everything and then the prince shows up and and then there's twins suddenly and it's, <laughs> the whole thing's a nightmare anyway um you just have to like support those original plot items sufficiently 
to get between them, right? So, uh, so that is, that's what February looks like for us. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about March <laughs> because I'm excited. We've got another special guest coming in for March. Christine, thank you for at the last minute agreeing to let me throw you completely <laughs> under the bus. Um, I hope we fixed your story a little bit. Um, so uh, if y'all are gonna write fanfic based on that credit, Christine. Um, <laughs> And uh, that's her idea. Um, but uh, for March, we have we have Angie B. And I don't, I know I've got like a stack of her books on my bedside table right now because they're a couple right over there. Super fun and tropey and um, and and delightful. So we're gonna talk a little bit about her writing process and a little bit about how she uses tropes to explore character. Cause I've been really, really plot focused um, the last couple of months. So I think it's gonna be super fun to talk about character tropes and, and how we get there and how we play with them. And uh, then I'm going to give everybody a great big buy this woman's books link because you should, but um, so that's that's what March will be, and this was February. Thanks again, Christine. Um, Thank you for, for <laughs> moving me forward on this this thing that I didn't think was ever going to be a story, and now who knows, maybe it might. Oh, that doesn't sound familiar <laughs> at all. <sighs> all right. All right. I can't stop recording. I'm working on it. I don't do this very often. All right. It's the button. Goodbye. It's the round we'll button. Next, Push the button. We'll see you next month. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>